Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in this morning. I wish to continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power, one of the most important books for our generation today, written in 1876 by R.W. Thompson, Secretary of the U.S. Navy. It was written during the time of the First Vatican Council, and the Declaration of Papal Infallibility and the ramifications that that declaration had upon Roman Catholics in this country and our very government and our Protestant way of life. Very important book, and it should be read by every Christian today, and that's why I've taken the opportunity to read it here on Inquisition Update for public perusal, both Roman Catholic and Protestant. Very, inf very informative book, a very, what I call, a prophetic book. R.W. Thompson foresaw the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order back in the 1870s, and he warned the American people about it. And uh, that's the aim and goal of Inquisition Update. Now, we are reading... Uh, Specific propositions that were put forward in Pope Pius IX's encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864. Yesterday we concluded with Proposition 33. Now we're talking about the very language used in this encyclical and uh, this syllabus of error. We're getting right into the meat and the bones of that encyclical. And it is through the study of the very language of this encyclical that we understand what the motive of the Vatican is for this country, to make America Catholic. Now, yesterday we concluded with Proposition number 33, and for continuity we'll read it again and then continue where we left off yesterday. Proposition 33 condemns those who say that, quote, the immunity of the Roman Catholic Church and of the Roman Catholic ecclesiastical persons derives its origin from the civil law, unquote. Here, says R.W. Thompson, it is distinctly claimed that the Roman Catholic clergy, wherever they may be, possess immunity above the law, which elevates them into a privileged and exclusive class above all other citizens, it makes them superior to all others and therefore renders it a positive duty that all others shall obey them. Okay? Quite audacious, arrogant language of this Pope in this encyclical. And it's somewhat amazing to me that R.W. Thompson didn't elaborate. He speaks about the immunity of the Roman Catholic priesthood and elaborating upon that just a little bit before I continue my thought, is that we can see the evidence of the influence of this, this Article 33, this Proposition 33, in the current global pedophile priest pandemic. The Roman Catholic priests are held immune from civil and criminal authorities. And their crimes, their unspeakable crimes against little boys and little girls, by the way, is held under the jurisdiction of the papacy, that the civil power has no authority to prosecute either civilly or criminally these pedophile priests. And we know this to be true. It's, it's public information. Now... But the encyclical also includes the immunity of the church, which at this point R.W. Thompson doesn't directly address. But the church, the Roman Catholic Church, is also immune from civil and criminal prosecution because every Roman Catholic Church is, in the view, in the view of the papacy, an embassy of the papacy. It is owned by the papacy. It is foreign territory. And the civil power of the United States 
literally has no jurisdiction on Roman Catholic Church property. A, a, a policeman cannot cross the threshold of a Roman Catholic Church without the permission of the bishop. So not only are the priests held immune from civil and criminal prosecution, but Roman, but the Roman Catholic Church is as well. Now, continuing where we left off yesterday on the program, Proposition 31 of the same class condemns the principle that ecclesiastical courts, this is a quote, quote, ecclesiastical courts for the temporal causes of the clergy, whether civil or criminal, ought by all means to be abolished, even without the concurrence and against the protest of the Holy See, unquote. This is equivalent to the direct assertion that the Roman Catholic clergy, for all civil and criminal acts, no matter how flagrant, now we're talking about the pedophile problem, should be tried by ecclesiastical courts alone and not by the civil courts where other people are tried. In other words, that they should try themselves, that the priests should try themselves in their own closed ecclesiastical courts. In other words, the fox gets to uh, try the other foxes who are all watching the hen house. There's no justice in this. Anyone who says that the priests or the church ought to be subject to the civil power is damned, according to the papacy. He says, in other words, they should try themselves. This principle, so diametrically opposed to our political institutions, is well understood by the priesthood and all the initiated followers in this country. The hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church know that they are immune to any trial for any civil or criminal charge. That they're hands off by the government. And that if they are ever charged with a crime, it will be heard in, a, in, a, in an ecclesiastical court where it is, it is uh, uh, a courtroom set up to try priests, a, a Vatican-established court. And it just amazes me. The injustice that is rampant all over the world by this priest pedophilia that the world doesn't try to ask the question, well, why is there so much injustice in the way the world handles these priests? Here it is, right here, in R.W. Thompson's book. Proposition 31 of the Syllabus of Error of Pope Pius IX. We're seeing the in-your-face consequences of the following of the dictates of Pope Pius IX in his syllabus, which simply is a reiteration of previous popes. This assertion that the priests of the Roman Catholic Church got their primacy from Christ, that they are infallible, and that they are lords of the spiritual realm, and that the civil realm is beneath them, and they should never have to answer to the civil realm, the civil power. To bring a Roman Catholic priest to trial would be like a civil court or a criminal court in this country attempting to bring Christ to trial for, for uh, accusations of crimes. That's how they view themselves. The hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church knows this. The laity of the Roman Catholic Church are held in ignorance. Now, he continues, the New York tablet, one of the most prominent organs, says, now this was a matter of great debate in this country, and here we have 
uh, a major periodical dealing with the subject. It says, quote, We do not acknowledge that in a state in which the proper relations between church and state exist, the clergy are amenable for their conduct to the civil courts or come under their jurisdiction. If guilty of offenses or crimes punishable by the civil courts, they can be tried and punished not in the civil courts, but in the ecclesiastical courts, unquote. And this was from the New York tablet, dated April 8, 1871. Now, following up this same idea so as to show what extent of authority these ecclesiastical or church courts would have and how completely they would be above the state and of the people, this same paper says, quote, The state has not supreme legislative authority, and civil laws which contravene the law of God do not bind the conscience. And whether they do or not contravene that law, the church, not the state or its courts, is the supreme judge. Unquote. Now, the author gives us a note at this point. He says, uh, in the New York tablet, dated April 8, 1871, the tablet has recently become more bold in announcing this doctrine of state dependence. The Reverend Henry Aston, in a sermon preached in New York, spoke of a gradual tendency. Listen to this. He spoke of a gradual tendency toward a union of church and state in this country in consequence of the papal teachings, in consequence of this encyclical and syllabus of error. And the New York Herald, referring to what he said, made this remark. Quote, there are thousands of Catholics in this land who do not place Rome above the United States and whose patriotism cannot be measured by fealty to religious dogmas and creeds, unquote. And that was an argumentative statement made in the Herald of November 4th, 1872, to which the tablet replied, and here's what the tablet said, quote, the Herald is behind the times and appears not yet to have learned that the quote-unquote thousands of Catholics it speaks of are simply no Catholics at all if it does not misrepresent them. Gallicanism is a heresy, and he who denies the papal supremacy in the, in the government of the universal church is as far from being a Catholic as he is who denies the incarnation or the real presence. The church is more than the country, and fealty to the creed God teaches and enjoins through her is more than patriotism. We must obey God rather than man, unquote. And referring then to the question raised by Mr. Aston, it says, quote, For ourselves, we answer no such questions. For our church is God's church and not accountable either to state or country, unquote. Again, from the New York tablet, November 16th, 1872. And it says, The tablet and the Herald have continued this controversy until the former, unable otherwise to extricate itself, has been compelled to insist that the basis of its whole argument is the fact that the power of the Roman Catholic Church over temporals is derived from the divine law. It says, quote, but the power of the Pope over temporal sovereigns never originated in or depended upon his temporal sovereignty of the states of the church, but was included in his spiritual authority as vicar of Christ and was always a purely spiritual and in no sense a temporal authority, unquote. New York Tablet, November 23rd, 1872. So this immunity all derives from the spiritual power of the Pope, which was conferred upon the first Pope, says the Roman Catholic Church, in Peter, the Apostle. And it is a lie. But what I want my readers to understand is that during the 1800s, 
there was much debate in this country about the Roman Catholic Church taking over the government. That by divine right, the Pope has the, the, the authority to control the state, to control the federal government of this country. And that to be a proper government, this government should accept that authority of the Pope over its laws and over its dominions and over its jurisdiction. And that any law of the Constitution, any law of the, of the land, whether it be federal law or state law, that usurps the authority or in any way touches the Roman Catholic Church, should be overthrown, should be overturned. And even to the degree that Roman Catholics were placed under a threat of excommunication if they did not rebel against this, this, this government. That the state government of this country should recognize in whole, in total, the Roman Catholic Church that it should establish the Roman Catholic Church as the official religion of this country, make America Catholic and subject all of its citizens to Roman Catholic canon law. And that they call patriotism. That's what they call true patriotism. When a knowledgeable adept of the Roman Catholic Church, one of its hierarchy, speaks of patriotism, this is what they mean. That they are loyal to their sovereign, that is, the Pope. And that true patriotism, true American patriotism, is complete subservience to the papacy. And now, if you've done any research into the Patriot Act, if you've looked it up on Google, and if you've seen any of the tenets of the Patriot Act, you'll recognize exactly what the word patriot means in its title subjection to the higher spiritual authority of the papacy and the destruction of Protestant rights. They called it the Patriot Act, but it's not patriotic to the, patriotic to the country or the Constitution. It's patriotic to the papacy. If you want to do any of your own research, I highly recommend that you do. Read as much as you can about the Patriot Act understanding the basis for the Patriot Act and reading it in that context. How can we consider ourselves patriots when we give up our rights for a false security? It was all a pretense to get us to lay down our Protestant rights and to subject ourselves voluntarily to papal authority and Roman Catholic canon law. It's, an, it's a backdoor overthrow of our government. That's what it is. Now, continuing with the book, it says, Thus the state would become, in every sense, subordinated to the Roman Catholic Church, and every one of its laws which the Pope should, either by himself or through his hierarchy, decide to be contrary to the law of God, would fall, because not binding on the conscience. And thus the law making all citizens equal, that giving freedom of religious belief to all, that which authorizes every man to embrace what religious belief his own conscience shall approve, that which tolerates different churches, that which separates the state from the church, that which secures free thought, free speech, and free press, in fine, all the great Protestant principles which lie at the very basis of our government would be destroyed because not binding upon the Roman Catholic conscience. The Pope understands this. All the Roman Catholic hierarchy in the United States understand it. And it is quite time that our Protestant people were beginning to realize the necessity of resisting such arrogant and audacious pretensions. That's right, the Protestants of this land maybe once had been, become aware during the 1800s, but I assert that the vast majority of Protestants today never think at all about the threat that Roman Catholicism poses. They're too busy worrying about the big boogeyman called Islam 
And don't you know that 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 ghost has been created to draw attention away from the Catholicization of our government? Now, continuing, it says, In the class entitled Errors About Civil Society, considered both in itself and in its relation to the church, Proposition number 39 uh, condemns the principle that, quote, the republic is the origin and source of all rights which are not circumscribed by any limits, which means simply that we must look to the state to ascertain what our rights are, but to the, excuse me, we must not look to the state to ascertain what our rights are, but to the church and to the pope. Proposition number 42 in the same class condemns that theory of government which provides that, quote, in the case of conflicting laws between the two powers, that is, church and state, the civil law ought to prevail, which means neither more nor less than this, that the laws prescribed by the Pope and his hierarchy shall override the laws of the United States and all the states, that whenever they are in conflict, the latter shall give way, and that the Pope shall become the law-making power of this country and govern it and all its citizens just as he pleases. Proposition number 45 of the same class condemns that principle of government which provides that, quote, the church ought to be separated from the state and the state from the church. This proposition constitutes one of the leading features of our government, one of its most boasted characteristics. To denounce it is to denounce that government. The Pope does denounce it, not only here, but necessar uh, by necessary implication, but in many other places, directly and immediately. He requires his Roman Catholic hierarchy to denounce it, and they obey him. He and they would have the church and the state united, the church governing the state. And thus they would put an end to our government which would be held to be the object of every man, priest, and layman who advocates the doctrines of this extraordinary document. In the class entitled Errors Concerning Natural and Christian Ethics, Proposition Number 43 condemns the principle that, quote, it is allowable to refuse obedience to legitimate princes, nay more, to raise, to, excuse me, to rise in insurrection against them, unquote. Our Declaration of Independence asserts this right of resistance to unjust princes, and but for, this, but for the, maintain, uh, the maintenance of it, we should have had a monarchical government in this country instead of a popular one. Here, then, the principle asserted by our fathers is repudiated and condemned by the Pope, and it would follow, if his teachings should prevail, that as our revolution was against God's law, therefore all the rights we have acquired by it are void, and it would be his duty, if he can, to remit us back again to our original state of dependence and compel us to admit the divine right of kings to govern all of mankind and of the Pope to govern the kings. And that was just the most concise description I've ever read about the Pope's New World Order. It's simply the restoration of the old. We just cited our, uh, Proposition number 63 in the, in the uh, Syllabus of Error, where the Pope condemns the justification of revolution. The implication is that the Revolutionary War was unjust. It was rebellion and that the form of government that sprang from that rebellion here in the United States is also rebellion, and that the popular form of government of the United States, the Republican form of government, should be restored to a kingdom, the divine right of kings, that the people don't have any authority to elect their own rulers, that God, through the Pope, elects the rulers and puts them in place, and they rule by divine right. It's a, 
it's a one it's just a sweeping condemnation of our entire form of government proposition 63 now we're going to continue in the class of errors entitled errors regarding the civil power of the sovereign pontiff proposition number 76 condemns the principle which asserts that quote the abolition of the temporal power of which the apostolic see and w is and was possessed remember the pope was dispossessed of this temporal power uh, during the French Revolution and during the Protestant Reformation. That's why the author uses the word was in brackets here. He says, the absolution of the temporal power of which the apostolic see is or was possessed would contribute to the greatest degree to the liberty and prosperity of the church, unquote. The, the possession of the temporal power by the Pope made him a king. Therefore, this is the same as to say that it is necessary for the Roman Catholic religion that the church should have a king. And as all the world should be governed by it in order to fulfill the divine command, hence all the world should be governed by a king. This makes the church a monarchy at Rome. And if it is necessary that it should be a monarchy at Rome, it must of necessity be so elsewhere, both in Europe and in the United States. All Roman Catholics insist that what the church is at one place, it is at all other places, that it has perfect unity. The last and concluding class of condemned errors are those having reference to modern liberalism. Among these, proposition number 77 condemns the principle which asserts that, quote, in the present day it is no longer expedient that the Catholic religion shall be held as the only religion of the state to the exclusion of all other modes of worship, unquote. What he means is this, that it is both proper and expedient that the Roman Catholic religion shall be the only religion, and that it shall be made by, a law, by law the religion of the state, to the exclusion of every other. Now, he who can not see that this would require the destruction of Protestantism and the overthrow of our government is blind, and he who would deny it is worse than blind. I would just add that this is a wholesale condemnation of those who do not recognize that the encyclical and syllabus of error was a direct attack on Protestantism. This syllabus of error by Pope Pius IX was an instrument of the Jesuits. It was a strategic part of the Counter-Reformation, a global condemnation of Protestantism. And as we've discovered early on in, the, in this book, the Bible was a target of the Counter-Reformation, that only the priest should have control of the Bible and control its printing and distribution and reading, and most importantly, the teaching associated with the Bible, also that Protestantism must be destroyed. Now, anyone who has read the Jesuit Oath understands that that is the primary goal of the Jesuit Order, the destruction of Protestantism and the Bible that brought it forth. Now, we're going to continue. Proposition number 78 of the same class condemns this principle of toleration, which follows the recognition of other religions besides the Roman Catholic. Quote, Whence it has been wisely provided by law in some countries called Catholic, that persons coming to reside therein shall enjoy the public exercise of their own religion. Unquote. This is all religious toleration stigmatized as an error, as against the divine command, 
and as inconsistent with the interests of the Roman Catholic Church. By this teaching, the Pope requires that those Protestants who go to Roman Catholic countries shall not be permitted to exercise their religion publicly. What a fitting response this is to the constant cry against Protestant intolerance in this country, made by those who are obliged to believe that religious toleration is offensive to God. The last proposition, Proposition 80, is the summing up of the whole, the final conclusion of the papal mind. It is a general and wholesale denunciation of all the progress and liberalism of the age and shows conclusively that the Pope would, if he had the power, turn the world back into the Egyptian darkness of the medieval times. Okay? We... R.W. Thompson makes it clear. The Pope makes it clear in Article 80 that if he had the power, he would restore the old world order. And it says, he condemns the principle which asserts that, quote, the Roman pontiff can and ought to reconcile himself to and agree with progress, liberalism, and civilization as lately introduced. And we can interpret the word lately introduced as being the Protestant Reformation. And the modernism and liberalism, as the Pope describes it, that came out of the Protestant Reformation. The papacy condemns this notion that it should conform to the modern times or the post-Protestant Reformation times. <clears throat> Thus, the avowal is emphatic that the infallible Pope must not become reconciled to or agree with any of these things. Standing alone in, in the world as God's representative, he plants his feet upon them all. As the sovereign Lord of the universe, he repudiates, denounces, and scorns them. The world must not go forward, but backward backward toward the quote-unquote holy empire which his predecessor struggled so hard to erect in which he would make himself the source of all authority and plunge all mankind into the degradation of ignorance and superstition. It must be observed that the Pope is stating all these, con these condemned propositions as quote, the principal errors, unquote, which he designs to stigmatize. All of them are heretical and must be so accepted by the faithful at the peril of their souls. Will they be so accepted is the question which comes up in all intelligent minds. Thousands of Roman Catholics in Europe have rejected them already, and thousands more will do so. In this country, the body of the laymen have not, have not learned their import or bearing but have drifted along in passive submission under the guidance of the priesthood who have tortured their ignorance, their ignorant acquiescence into intelligent assent and have thus flattered both the Pope and themselves into, into the belief that their final victory over Protestantism and popular institutions is near at hand. Will this submission continue? If it does... There's not a virtuous or patriotic heart in the land that does not sigh at the contemplation of the consequences which may follow. What are those consequences? A state-established church, Roman Catholicism, and a return of the Holy Roman Inquisition. And this assertion is going to be clearly made in just a moment here in this book. It says, The contents of the encyclical and syllabus are unknown to most of these laymen. They have appeared together in few, if any, of their papers and periodicals. A leading Jesuit journal of, the, uh, of New York has published the syllabus, but without note or comment. It has taken care, however, to accompanying it in the same paper with documents of kindred import, so that such of the faithful as should peruse it would be furnished with a key to its proper interpretation especially upon those points of which refer to the civil and political affairs. One of these is, quote, a great pastoral for Easter Sunday, unquote. Uh, this is the title 
of an article. One of these, the great pastoral of Easter Sunday from Archbishop Manning, herein wherein he instructs his flocks in reference to the true principles upon which all government should be based, showing what is conveyed also by the encyclical and syllabus, that those founded upon the will of the people are all wrong and heretical, and that none are right but those founded upon the religion of the Roman Catholic Church. These are the words in which he expresses this idea. Quote, The faith and knowledge which comes from God are the sole base of stable government and public peace. They bind together all orders of a people by a unity of mind and will, and they transmit the traditions of law, of authority, and of obedience from generation to generation. Unquote. Another is a great united pastoral from a number of German archbishops and bishops on May of 1871 designed primarily to enforce obedience to the dogma of infallibility. In this, doc in this document, an attempt is made to defend against the charges of Dr. Dollinger and others that the papacy designs to interfere with the domestic politics of the states and reestablish the quote-unquote medieval hierarchic system, unquote, the old world order, I will just add. But it is so made as to bear the appearance of sincerity to the public, while at the same time the real object is sufficiently made known to the initiated. They say, quote, of all the bulls designed uh, designated by the opponents of the doctrine of infallibility as dangerous to the state. Only one is dogmatic, the bull Unum Sanctum by Pope Boniface VIII. And this has been accepted by a general council, so that the infallibility of the general councils and the church would be quite as dangerous to the state as that of the pope." Unquote. Pope Boniface VIII strained the authority of the papacy to a higher pitch than any of his predecessors. He was not only one of the most ambitious, but one of the most execrable and infamous popes, having been charged by the authority of the powerful sovereign, Philip the Fair of France, with, quote, denying the immortality of the soul, unquote, and, quote, the presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, and calling the host a piece of bread to which he paid no respect, and maintaining that the Pope, being infallible, could commit incest, robberies, and murders without being criminal, and that it was heresy even to accuse him of having sinned, and that he openly proclaimed fornication to be one of the most beautiful laws of nature, and that he lived in concubinage with his two nieces, and had several children by both of them. John Bellani copied and preserved from authentic documents some of his axioms, among which are the following, quote, Men have souls like those of beasts. The one are as much immortal as the other. And this one, The gospel teaches more falsehoods than truths. The delivery of the virgin is absurd. The incarnation of the Son of God, ridiculous. The dogma of transubstantiation is a folly. The sums of money which the fable of Christ has produced the priests are incalculable. Religions are created by the ambitious to deceive men. Ecclesiastics must speak like the people, but they have not the same belief. It is no greater sin to abandon oneself to pleasure with a young girl or a young boy than to rub one's hands together. We must sell in the church all that the simple wish to buy. Close quotes. This pope was, of course, infallible by virtue of the decision of the Council of Trent, which teaches that, quote, however wicked and flagitious it is certain that they still belong to the church, and of this the faithful are frequently to be reminded in order to be convinced that were even the lives of our ministers debased by crimes, 
they are still within her pale and therefore lose no part of their power with which her ministry invests them, unquote. And being capable of committing any error in matters concerning the powers of the papacy and the welfare of the church, being in these respects the vice-regent of God, though as a man he was utterly debased, his bull, Unum Sanctum, was an act of infallibility. And therefore these German bishops solemnly announce in this pastoral that it has been accepted by a general council that it has consequently become dogmatic and is now a part of the religious faith of the Roman Catholic Church, which all of its members are bound to entertain and which only heretics deny. They do not publish the bull, for it would, it would contradict in flat terms what had just preceded the reference to it in the pastoral and thus startle the public mind. Besides, in addressing the priesthood, there was no necessity for this, for they know already of all the bulls issued by all the popes from the beginning that called Unum Sanctum stands alone in impudence and audacity. Inasmuch, then, as this bull is thus declared to be binding upon the conscience of all Roman Catholics of the world, it is pointed out to the priesthood in the very paper which, contends, which contains the syllabus as the key to its interpretation, its contents should be generally understood so that the public judgment may be correctly formed. This is what it says. Quote, Either sword is in the power of the church, that is to say the spiritual and the material. The former is to be used by the church but the lateral, excuse me, but the latter for the church. The one in the hand of the priest, the other in the hands of the kings and soldiers, but at the will and the pleasure of the priest. It is the spiritual, it is, uh, excuse me, it is right that the temporal sword and authority be subject to the spiritual power. Moreover, we declare, say, define, and pronounce that every human being should be subject to the Roman pontiff to be an article of necessary faith, unquote. With this distinct explanation of the political religious faith promulgated by the infallible popes and sanctioned by a general council, before us we can fully understand the encyclical and syllabus of Pope Pius IX and should be at no loss to tell what Archbishop Manning meant when he said, quote, the hated syllabus will have its justification and would have saved society. Let me just ask my listeners, what is the implication of what Archbishop Manning said? Let me read it again. The hated syllabus will have its justification and would have saved society. The direct implication is that if the world rebels against the syllabus of error and maintains its republican forms of government and maintains its position of stripping the Pope of its temporal power, society will be destroyed. It's an ultimatum. But let me tell you, if the syllabus is followed and the United States and all the governments of the world conform to the papal form of government and this becomes a global holy Roman Empire God's people will be destroyed and now the author is going to make this clear its justification will be found in the complete wreck of all the Protestant and non-Catholic nations whose people are to be saved from themselves by being made the degraded and miserable subjects of the papacy. And then, when the Jesuit shout of gratified revenge shall go up from Rome, and the debris of shattered popular government shall be lying all around, the temporal sword will be drawn at the will and the pleasure of the priest, 
And he who shall dare to question that all this is the will of God will be racked in every limb by the tortures of the Inquisition or consumed by its re-enkindled flames. Unquote. R. W. Thompson, in the most clear language that he ever uses in this book, has just declared and warned the American people should this country allow its government to become papal, there's an inquisition lying in wait. Once again, the innocent blood of God's people will be shed all over this land. A reinstitution of the Holy Roman Inquisition and the reenkindling of its full flames. R. W. Thompson clearly predicts an inquisition in this country. And I believe that this is one of the most prophetic, non-religious books I've ever read in my life. R. W. Thompson has it right. And so does Inquisition Update. If we allow the government of the United States, through the ecumenical movement and the unity of all the Christians in this country to the Roman Catholic Church, if together they achieve this holy Roman government, this slow transition from a Protestant, Republican form of government, a government of, by, and for the people, into a papal dictatorship, a papal kingship, such as we have today, there's no room for doubt what the next, what next will fall, and that is the heads of those who reject this new form of government this new papal form of government. And on a personal note, I believe that day has arrived. I don't think we have long to wait in this country before the heads of God's people begin to roll. You know, they've strategically made a connection using the term fundamentalists. There are two fundamentalists described in the mainstream media. Religious fundamentalists, both Islamic and Protestant. We all hear about Muslim fundamentalism, Islamic fundamentalism, and radical Islam, and this and that. Do you know that we've been classed, us Bible-believing Christians, as fundamentalists? They're already setting the stage for a holy Roman crusade. Once the Muslims have been destroyed, once the radical fundamentalist Islamists have been destroyed, to turn those same weapons against those who will not compromise the gospel, those who are regarded as fundamentalists all across this country. They've simply used one word to describe us both, and one could not be any different. One could not be more different from the other. They've already set the stage for the Inquisition that's going to happen in this country. Now we're going to continue with Chapter 8 of the book. The, pay, the, the, uh, the author's going to speak about the infallibility before the late decree, speaking of papal infallibility at the First Vatican Council. We're going to speak about the Pope's temporal power being not divinely oriented, uh, originated. And we're going to speak about the Italian people who had rebelled against the papacy and the government of the papal states. We're going to talk about Jesuitism and the mutilation of books at Rome, the union of church and state by Constantine. We're going to talk about the very foundations of this synagogue of Satan called Roman Catholic. We'll continue with chapter 8 of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson on the broadcast when we return next week. Thanks for listening. <laughs> 